And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And let us pray. We come to you, O Lord, for knowledge. We come to you that knowledge of your word would bring us wisdom. We come to you for knowledge of your word that would bring us wisdom, that would show us how to live and to light the path of life for us. Help us now as we reflect on your word to gain knowledge and wisdom that we might follow your path for us. I pray, O Lord, that as I preach that your word is made clear and I'm not heard at all so that you might be wholly heard. In Christ's name I pray, amen. God does not want you to be happy. God wants you to be holy. When you are holy... Happiness gets added in as a bonus. If you pursue simply happiness, you're very unlikely to attain it. But if you pursue holiness, you will also be happy. The story of Joseph helps us understand how the pursuit of holiness rather than happiness gets us to the place that we really want to be anyway, both holy and happy. And the story of Joseph is a story that goes through great unhappiness great sin on the way. I suppose that the best place to start the story of Joseph is not with Joseph, but with his father Jacob. And the best place to start the story of Jacob for our purposes today is when Jacob steals his, the birthright from his brother Esau. You remember the story how Esau was you know, kind of a ruddy guy and uh, kind of an animalistic kind of person. And Joseph kind of massaged his ego and fed him some soup and got him to trade one thing for another. He tricked his brother. Then he tricked his father. He's not pursuing holiness, is he? He's pursuing happiness. Then the brother, Esau, chases him out. And Jacob goes to another, another uh, um, area and he falls in love with the wrong girl. He falls in love with Rachel, who has an older sister named Leah. And older sisters are always married first. But he wants to marry Rachel. And so Leah and Rachel's father, whose name is Laban, plays a trick on Jacob and gets him to marry Leah and eventually marry Rachel. Is it starting well, is it? It gets worse. Leah has children. Her oldest son is named Reuben. Rachel eventually has 
children. Her oldest son is named Joseph, who is the hero of our story today. After many years in this other land, Jacob decides to bring his family, which now includes Rachel and Leah and children and handmaidens and a bunch of other folks, and they are going to go back and see Esau to kind of work things out and to have a meeting. And they get to a river, and on one side of the river, Joseph, uh, Jacob, um, Jacob puts his oldest sons and his flocks way out in front so that when Esau meets them, if he's angry, he'll take his anger out on his oldest sons, Reuben included. And he puts Leah out in front of everybody else. But right in front of him, he stays in the very back. The truth is, he's a chicken. He stays in the very back. Just in front of him, he puts Rachel and Joseph. How do you think that made his other brothers feel? They weren't very well disposed to Joseph. Because their father was willing to sacrifice them and their mother so that he could have a little bit of lead time escaping with Joseph and Joseph's mother. Then Joseph has these two dreams. First, he dreams that these uh, stalks bow down to him, symbolizing his brothers. Then he, bre- then he dreams that the stars and the, the moon and the sun bow down to him, symbolizing his parents and his brothers. And he unwisely tells this dream to everybody. And the brothers are like, that guy, he dreams. Even his parents are perplexed at what that might mean. But his father, who loved Rachel, loves Joseph, and decides that Joseph is going to be the one to inherit the business, and that all his brothers are going to be the workers. And the way the Scriptures symbolize this is with the coat of many colors that Joseph is, getting, is, is given. It's a coat that you can't do shepherding in. All the other brothers have regular clothes. But Joseph is raised above them. So one day, Joseph is sent out to find the brothers. And as he approaches, they see him from a distance. And they say, let's, there he is. Let's, let's just get rid of him. Let's just kill him. Nobody will know. It's just us. We're out here in the middle of the wilderness. Let's take that coat. Let's kill a goat, put its blood on it. Take it back to Dad. Dad, is this the coat of the son that You love so much? We hope not. (laughs) The oldest brother, Reuben, to his credit, says, no, 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 no. Let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in this cistern, dry cistern. Let's just throw him in this pit. And Reuben has a plan to come back and get him out later. But while Reuben is gone, some traders come along, slave traders. And the other brothers say, hey, now we can make some cash. So Joseph gets sent down to Egypt, where the traders are going. And honestly, up until this point, when you look at the brothers and you look at Joseph, you kind of look at Joseph and you think, yeah, he's kind of a, he's kind of a snotty kid. You know, he's... he's But he goes from here to here. He's sold into the house of a guy named Potiphar. 
I don't know about you, but I know that if I was in Joseph's shoes, I would be bitter. I would be disappointed. I've gone from being free and kind of the little, you know, going to be the ruler to being a, the slave at the bottom of the hierarchy even of the slave. It would just be, I don't know what I would do. I don't know how I would react. If my goal in life was simply happiness, it might have broken me. Because I would have looked around me and I thought, I am not going to be happy anymore. My freedom's gone. My leadership is gone. But Joseph is in the pursuit of holiness. Something about being sent down to Potiphar changes his outlook, his Time in the pit changes him. And in his pursuit of holiness, he becomes a good worker. It just seems to be the way it always is. He becomes a good worker and he works his way up in Potiphar's household. He assumes more responsibility more responsibility. He does a good job. Potiphar rewards him. And eventually, the scriptures record a Potiphar, a record of Potiphar that Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. And then Joseph lost another coat. Potiphar's wife she saw Joseph, he's good looking, he's successful. Maybe Potiphar's a little old, I don't know. Potiphar's wife is attracted to Joseph. And Joseph says, oh, no, 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 no. Mm-mm-mm-mm. But one day she grabs his coat and he runs away and she says, look what this guy has done. So Potiphar takes him and throws him in jail. Again, if I had been Joseph, look, God, you, 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 you first off, you put me down here in Egypt, away from my family, away from my responsibility, and I was faithful. I didn't just give up. I tried to do my best. I tried to do what you would have me do, and now this. Now I'm in jail. Joseph does in, Potiphar's, in, in the jail as he had done in a Potiphar's house. He does not focus on his happiness. Oh, I'm not saying he was happy every minute he was in jail. But he does not focus on his happiness. He remains holy and strives after his holiness. And after a little while, the warden saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Exactly the same words that the scripture uses to describe Potiphar's reaction. There are two fellow prisoners in the jail with Joseph. A baker and the king's cupbearer, one who was a personal assistant to the king or to the pharaoh. And they have dreams just like Joseph had had dreams. One of them dreams about a vine and, and crushing the, uh, the, the grapes and filling a cup. And the other dreams about having baked goods on his head and birds picking the baked goods. And Joseph interprets the dreams for the two of them and says to the baker, this is bad news. You're going to lose your life. Pharaoh will not forgive you. And he says to the cupbearer, this is good news. Pharaoh will forgive you and restore you to your place. And sure enough, not long after that, the, uh, the baker is beheaded. The cupbearer is brought back into Pharaoh's presence and given his original job back. And he immediately forgets all about Joseph. And Joseph is left with another couple of years of prison. Prison. 
No one is happy in prison. But after a couple of years, Pharaoh has some dreams. He has two dreams. First, he dreams that there are some fat cows that get eaten up by skinny cows. Then he dreams that there's these fat ears of corn that get swallowed up by these skinny ears of corn. And he's perplexed by these dreams. And so is everyone in his court. And finally, the cupbearer goes, hey, I know a guy. So they call Joseph in. There's a little phrase in the story there where the Pharaoh calls Joseph and it says that Joseph shaves before he goes to see the Pharaoh. Anytime you see in the Scriptures little things that seem to make no sense, why would the Scriptures tell us that Joseph shaved? Of course he's going to shave. Anytime the Scriptures lay some little thing on you like that, and you're like, what in the world is that? That can't make it has a meaning. You see, Hebrews didn't shave. They might trim their beard, but they didn't shave. Egyptians shaved. God put Joseph in Potiphar's household, and Joseph learned what it meant to be an Egyptian. And then God put Joseph in Pharaoh's prison. And Joseph learned what it meant to run an Egyptian governmental organization. And so he shaved and went to see the Pharaoh. He interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams. The seven, the seven fat are seven good years. The seven skinny are seven bad years. One will follow the other. You need to get ready. God is telling you to get ready. And the scriptures say that Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of getting the land ready. I'm convinced that before Joseph was brought into Pharaoh's presence, the Pharaoh talked to the prison warden and he said, this guy Joseph, we were thinking about bringing him into the court. What do you know about him? And the warden would have said, oh, he's he's my top prisoner. He takes care of things. I don't know how he got it, but oh, wait, Potiphar. Potiphar brought him in. He's a great one. So Pharaoh called in Potiphar. Potiphar, this guy, what do you know about him? Well, my wife told this story about him. But when he worked for me, God blessed him in all that he did. He worked hard. He's a good one. And so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I'm going to set you over the whole land. No one is going to be second to you except for me. Now I need you to take care of things. And Joseph did. For the next seven years, they built granaries and they brought all the grain, all of the extra grain that they could bring in. And there was a lot of extra grain because there were seven bumper crops in a row. They brought all of the extra grain in and after 70 years, there was a year of famine. Then another. And the famine was widespread. And Joseph's father... And his brothers ran out of food. And the father said to the brothers, Go down to Egypt and buy us some food. We, we're going to die. And the brothers went down to Egypt. And of course, they had no idea that Joseph was there. And they were brought in front of Joseph. And they didn't recognize him. He'd shaved. He was all cleaned up. He looked good. And why would... You know, it just never occurred to him, to them. And Joseph tested them. But crucially, Joseph forgave his brothers. Joseph 
forgave his brothers. I don't know what your families are like, but I would wager that every person in this room here today has someone they need to forgive. That your relationship might be made right. My father has seven brothers and sisters. He had seven brothers and sisters. Five older, who were the children of Doris. Three younger, who were the children of Lillian. There was always, there is, separation and distance. A few years ago, my brother and I were out in Kansas City uh, where they all live, or most of them live, and we were doing uh, a funeral for my uncle, my Uncle John. And uh, after the funeral, we were visiting with the family, and uh, it had been a couple of days after the funeral, and, and, and I said to my Aunt Ruth, one of the five, where does your sister Joyce live, one of the three? We're going to go see her. It's, how do I get there? It's 20 minutes away. One lives in KCK, one lives in KC Mo. And she said, I, I don't know where she lives. And I said, where does Joyce live? And she said, I do not know where that woman lives. Who do you need to forgive? In my family, unfortunately, my grandfather and both my grandfather, my grandmothers passed away. There's not going to be any forgiveness with them. And it's my hope that the remaining brothers and sisters are able to work their things out. If your desire is always happiness, and not holiness, it will tend towards revenge, not forgiveness. The story of Joseph, as it comes into my heart and as it speaks into our life, is a story of a man whose desire for holiness brings about forgiveness in a family for at least two generations that has experienced little but bitterness and brokenness. Joseph's brothers come down and they see Joseph. He reveals himself to them. And they're completely freaked out. The scriptures say that they're dismayed. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. They don't know whether to be happy or to be afraid. This is what Joseph says to them. God sent me before you to preserve you and your families. It was not you who sent me here. but God. That is looking past. That is forgiving. That is seeking holiness and being given happiness. Let's pray.
God, sometimes we sin. Sometimes we are sinned against. Sometimes we're caught in some third party sin and our lives are broken apart. We pray, O oh Lord, that we would be a people who seek your holiness. And don't worry too much about whether today is happy or not. And instead worry about whether we are being faithful to you and trust that you will make things right. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If your story needs changing, if your family's story needs changing, as we stand to sing hymn 529, How Firm a Foundation, I invite you to come forward and I'll pray with you that your search for holiness might bring happiness.